Tennis Playing, Administrative Work and Teaching with Dr. Eric Stomberg. Stay inspired. So to start out, Eric, let's dive into chatting about our great organization, the IDRS, established in December 1971. The International Double Read Society is a member-based organization made up of professional double read players, amateurs, hobbyists, university and college instructors, music t teachers, institutions, instrument manufacturers, double read product retailers, read makers, and enthusiasts. The society has 3,000 members from 56 countries. Eric is our IDRS president, among many other officers, staff members, competition advisory committees, a diversity subcommittee, a commissioning subcommittee, and volunteers. We are celebrating the Society's 50th anniversary this year. Eric, could you share with us any Society highlights or responsibilities or reflections as president with us? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, Julie. Thanks so much for having me um, and for our uh, fun and spirited chat uh, that was posted on the YouTube. So yeah, the, the IDRS, as you said, is in its 50th year and um, we were actually born in the same year, I think pretty close to the same month in, um, in 1971. <laughs> so I am also approaching my 50th year. Uh, or in my 50th year, I should say, um, as a person. And so it's pretty, you know, it's an honor to lead the organization. And um, this, the end of this year um, is the end of my term. Uh, this is the second term that I've served as president. And um, we have been quite busy with, with a lot of um, policy making and things that, you know, for, kind of worked out that due to the pandemic, we didn't have in-person conferences uh, the last two summers. And so um, that we obviously had virtual events, which were uh, exciting and, and quite successful, I think. Um, so yeah, we've, we've, uh, we're embarking on, on the formation of a brand new uh, nominating committee, which will choose the next board that will start in January. So that's that's kind of the remainder of our time uh, on what is currently called the Executive Committee, um, is to uh, in, instill the new, or install the, the new uh, uh, committee that will choose the, you know, board that will be uh, coming up for our members to, um, to, to ratify, essentially. So, there's there's been a lot going on in that and, and wonking and things of that nature, but I think the goal of anybody leading any organization is that you will you, you strive to leave the organization as strong if not stronger as when you found it and when you were uh, entrusted with leading it. And I I do really hope that you know come next year the the members uh, will feel that our society is in a in a good healthy place. Um, we've been very fortunate with the generosity of, of the members um, sticking with our organization through difficult times in the pandemic. And, um, and we're, yeah, we're just so thankful to have members who are, who are very thoughtful and giving. Um, and many, we have something like over 50% of the members uh, join at a level higher than they need to. And, um, to just help the organization, and that that has helped with things like uh, supporting the commissioning uh, project that we've launched into, and um, are just this is kind of the first full year of it, uh, and so we're yeah we're excited about those new opportunities, and I think we're, all of us currently on the executive committee are, are really excited to see what the next five years, ten years, fifteen years, <laughs> hopefully fifty years will bring. Eric, could you share a glimpse into what inspired you to become president just a couple of years ago and, and what that's been like? Sure. I, you know, the, the reality is that, um, 
a lot of the changes that we've made um, in in the society and the choosing uh, and selection and ratification of of future boards um, will will make the process completely different than what I um, went through. So I essentially was asked to uh, if I would be interested in in serving as the secretary uh, of of IDRS or being considered for that um, years and years ago. And so that was my, um, actually I was a competition chair of the Young Artists Competition uh, for, for a cycle before that. But, um, and so that yet yeah, goes all the way back there. I then became the, the first vice president and then the president after that. And, and all of those terms were quite long. So we've, we've adjusted many, many things. Uh, but all to say, I thought it was quite an honor when the the, um, the executive committee at that time, via uh, Dan Stolper, who was my colleague at the Interlochen Center for the Arts, um, approached me about about my interest in it. And I, at that point, I had already started to endeavor in um, administrative work um, at Interlochen, and it was really fascinating to me. I had no clue it would end uh, with the society. Um, with you know, with me leading the society, I didn't didn't think about it that way. But um, it's it's been really eye opening. It's it's been wonderful to meet so many different people. Um, to set Guinness Book of World Records in Granada, Spain, <laughs> in 2018, for the largest um, mass wind gathering, or <laughs> I forget the category. Um, uh, and really just to be around people who have such a love for our instruments and 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 engage with the society in so many different ways. Um, you know, musicians who are, are um, who have other careers and play double reed instruments or the vendors who, who supply so many of us uh, with uh, instruments and, and gadgets and reeds and all sorts of stuff, um, and of course those those uh, musicians who are uh, professional performing musicians who, who you know are, play their instruments for their livelihood, and and so it's a really really great group of uh, of members, and uh, I've just yeah I've I've enjoyed it greatly. It's been it has been certainly a, a unfortunate situation that we've had two in person conferences that have had to um, be, be canceled or postponed. And that, that is a frustration, I think, for all of us, and certainly for me. We're looking forward to next year in Colorado and hopefully setting records for the biggest conference ever. <laughs> Could you share a little bit about the process shifting to virtual? Yeah, we, um, as many of the members of IDRS know, the conferences are, are really put on by the hosts and a hosting institution. So the executive committee and the, the board uh, coming up doesn't normally have uh, you know day-to-day -day operations in putting on a conference and so it was new to some of us now some of the members obviously had hosted conferences themselves and that was very helpful um, but ultimately we decided that that our members really deserved to to have an opportunity to share um, their their works. Um, first year was that we had last year in 2020 was a little bit different than this year, um, but we we ultimately wanted those musicians who had applied to present uh, first in Iowa City and then in Boulder, Colorado, which which ended up getting postponed. Uh, we wanted them to have the opportunity to present their um, their works. Now, not having an orchestra, a virtual orchestra, we didn't have any of the you know concerto type artists um, present, you know, you know, unless they were presenting something else, because that didn't make much sense. And so, um, but all to say, we had a, a massive amount of uh, uh, presentations this last uh, virtual symposium at the end of July. Um, and, and so we, we learned a lot, we, you know, invested a lot in our uh, the company that works uh, for us for our website and, and help to put some of that in place. Um, you know, probably anybody who's done these virtual things as a plan B 
learns stuff along the way that they wish they had done better. And I, I think this, our second one was certainly more uh, involved than the first one. Um, and if we ever had to do a third one again, I'm sure it would be even even better yet. We're hoping that's not the case. Having said that, we realized really quickly that um, being able to engage with, with double read players from around the globe was um, significantly enhanced. We had no uh, entry fee for these virtual uh, events, and um, we reached so many people that we don't normally reach. And so I think going forward, especially with uh, a new board being installed next year, there likely will be more uh, virtual events. Now, maybe not to the level of you know 120 <laughs> presentations <laughs> over six days, but um, I think we'll see more of that as we go forward. Could you share a bit more about forming a board? Sure. I mean, you know, the major uh, change that that this executive executive committee. Um, engaged with was rewriting our, our bylaws, essentially. We, it mm. used to be called a constitution, or there is a constitution, and the members um, have now uh, voted in a new version of that called a code of regulations, which is by law what it has to be called in the state of Ohio, where we're incorporated as a nonprofit. Um, so I won't get into the weeds of all of that, because there's been a lot of discussion of all of that specifics, but all to say um, the board is expanding to 10 members. And um, our, our hope and intent, and I think uh, the success in this, is that um, it will much, much better represent um, our community um, and it, it, including people who aren't, aren't necessarily in the organization right now, but it will better represent and have a chance to represent and give opportunity to uh, double read players around the world. So it, it the I in IDRS is super important, and um, it, it is true that we have, you know, 75% of our organization is based in the United States, and that's great. Um, we would love that, you know, we'd love membership to continue growing, but um, we, we do have a, a specific board position now for, um, you know, representing um, our associate organizations. Uh, of which we have a number of them around the globe. And so I think there is just going to be a lot of really interesting thoughts coming in and a lot of great discussion. And that, that's where new initiatives and, and, and more um, inclusivity will come from. And so, you know, that's, that's really important to us. There has also been steps and actions taken towards BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, and people of color and gender balance in the society. Could you share more about this with us? Yeah, there's there has um, you know been an incredible uh, change, I would say, in 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 the way the executive committee has. Um, engaged with this topic um, and by by this topic I mean something that is is part of our lives part of the society's um, you know necessity in moving forward and and something that just honestly hadn't hadn't been um, discussed on this level at least in my time on the executive committee um, I can't speak for times before I joined, but the reality is we were an organization that's 50 years old and we've had one woman president and, and this executive committee, um, and very, 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 very few persons of color on the executive committee or in other important positions, uh, whether on the staff or, um, both unpaid and, and paid staff. And so, um, there are a lot of things that have changed. Um, you know, every job description we have now for a paid staff position uh, has specific language that, that the board uh, approved and that has to be used. Um, obviously, the, there's really specific language about the composition of the next board, and that that is mandated now by the passing of the new code of regulations. So that's um, you know, that that's very clear that that will. Uh, be part of that um, was solidifying a uh, process that had been going on for years, which generally the vice president, uh, first vice president, had um, often been the unofficial president-elect um, because 
it's you know it's a big organization. There's a it's a large budget, um, surprisingly larger than some might think, and um, and so having that familiarity with the organization is pretty important, um, especially with vendors and with you know the the um, instrument makers and our our members uh, at large. And so um, uh, all to say, you know, we it looks very uh, very likely that we will now have our second woman president um, in the next uh, the next go around and and everything else of course is is uh, will be new outside of me as the past president um, that one I can't get out of I, there's no way to <laughs> to change that one so um, uh, yeah I think we're we're just excited for the for the new look of the board come January um, but I I have to say I'm I'm so thankful to the incredible time and energy and um, difficult conversations and all of that, that that this current leadership has had um, because it's been uh, it's been a lot you know it, there's no doubt it's been a lot it's it's taken a toll on people um, and uh, but I think the 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 reality is that that we um, are absolutely trying to do the best by our members and and to make our organization as welcoming as possible and and we still have steps to go as do a lot of uh, arts organizations uh, similar to us but um, we we feel proud that we've you know moved the ball down the field uh, as it were with with uh, with a lot of different different uh, specific uh, areas in in this this uh, greater topic of inclusion and diversity. So Eric wanted to dive in about celebrating your 20 years teaching at the Interlochen Center for the Arts. Could you share with us any reflections or lessons or realizations um, on your time with the center? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I would say that one of the most important things is that even if I forget everything else. If I can remember that number, I will remember how long I've known Lee Munoz, um, because that's where I first met her in my, my first year of teaching there. So, um, yeah, so I'm starting my 21st year um, as what's called a visiting instructor at Interlochen Arts Academy, uh, which is a, a significant boarding school, um, obviously in here in, in Michigan, in the United States. And um, you know, it's, it's been a, um, it's hard to believe it's 20 years, you know, but the, the amount of students that I've had the, the pleasure to work with there, um, and these are high school students for those, you know, if, if people are listening later, obviously Richard and Lee know that, but, um, and so I, there's also been, you know, that same amount of time at the arts camp, um, which is where I met you, Julie. And so um, all of that uh, has allowed celebration last year, um, the 20th year, but that was, of course, not possible with the pandemic. So I'm, I'm hoping that in one of these upcoming years, we can have the big, big celebration to just celebrate all of the work that the students have done. And, you know, they're over all those years, I mean, there are students obviously who are performing uh, and teaching professionally. There are students who have gone into the medical field. There are so the students who are doing all sorts of things uh, in their their lives, and it's just great to see. Um, yeah, to see you know students, of course, now having children and all this stuff. It really makes you think. Oh my gosh, this is, I've been around a while, um, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's been a, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of travel. I was, you know, it's, it's it has put a lot of, uh, uh, miles, uh, um, on the car driving to and from the airport you here and there. But, um, but anyway, it's just a, a joy. I think, I think any teacher, and I said this before is, uh, um, successful really because of dedicated students, you know, doing the hard work and, um, and that's a huge part of it. So I'm just, you know, I, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't be there that long um, if if the students hadn't have worked so hard and and uh, accomplished so many things. 
thinking back on your 29 year old self, um, stepping into, you know, our 30 year old self into Interlochen and, and going on this teaching journey, um, and looking back 20 years, what, what would, what advice would you tell yourself? One thing I would encourage, um, others to think about is to just jump in like, you know, feet first to something and just say yes and, and try the, it was kind of a crazy time when I, when it all happened. I mean, there was a very interesting way in which it all came down, you know, at that time. But, um, I think what I've learned from it, um, and it took me a while, but is that regardless of how busy one is, and I, I you know, I hear that a lot and I, I used to think, oh, that's kind of fun. And then I thought, well, you know, it, it's really the quality that one does things. Like it doesn't matter how busy you are. Um, but if, if you're the product that you're um, making or the, the, the studio you're teaching or the concerts you're playing or whatever it is, um, those things have to be at, at a high level. And, and, and that takes dedication and it takes commitment to it. Um, and so I, I would just you know, encourage anybody to, um, to really dedicate yourself to the craft of whatever it is that you're doing. Um, because the successes usually come after that, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. and so, um, and it does make a lot of people really busy. That's for sure. But, um, um, I guess the, the other thing I would say is, um, it can be dangerous to be actually too busy so that you're not healthy and you're not balanced and you're, you know, you could get sick and things like, so, so just, you know, having different, you know, a lot of different things to do and a lot of different positions doesn't, doesn't make one whole. And so I, I think that's something I learned, have learned along the way. And currently, you know, I'm always working on, um, is to, uh, to find balance in your, in your life, you know, with, with the things outside of what you do for your living it would be mm -hmm. quite important as well with interlock and being in nature how did you find yeah having nature and music being one <laughs> yeah it, you know i i can't say that i've always been great at that i it was it was a visit of, from your teacher uh, barry sees who came and was um doing a class for my students at interlock and he did a, a number of them over the years although i can't remember which year this was but um he um, I know I knew he had arrived. Um, he drove up from Cleveland and had arrived, and like I couldn't find him, you know. But he was walking by the lake. He was just, you know, taking a, taking a, a, a little walkabout by the uh, by one of the lakes on the campus, and he, he, you know, he said, "Oh, I just." I, was really in it and doing so many things. And I was like, oh, I haven't seen a lake in, you know, in like months, even though I'm here. So I, I remember that, you know, um, and I would say now I'm, you know, I'm trying to do uh, uh, better with, with uh, you know, connecting with, with nature. Certainly in the summer, it's just a glorious place. And, and my wife and I um, enjoy kayaking on the lakes and, and um, just being in nature and there were some annoying crows this summer unfortunately they were so <laughs> loud and they would start up at you know 6 30 a.m it was brutal so we yeah we <laughs> we, we didn't have good success it was scaring them off but we tried there's a question from richard in our chat and he's written as one who got us the first idrs 501c3 I'm curious, how has it moved about and why? Right. It, it moved from, I believe it was Michigan where it started. Is that right, Richard? Mm. Um, okay. Cause I it, believe so. Um, but it, it's currently in Ohio and I, yeah, yeah. The, the, the first meeting, uh, and Richard probably knows more about this than I do, but I've, I've received a lot of information from a lot of people about uh, the beginnings of the, of the, um, organization and actually had a really, really fun conversation with Alan Fox about this. And, um, uh, but the, I think the first meeting was in Ann Arbor, kind of the, you know, beginnings of it all. Um, uh, or it sure says Texas. So I, um, uh, when I 
started with the organization, we had it was already an Ohio-based nonprofit, and and um, my assumption is that something you know with you know the treasurer at that time probably lived in Ohio because our our address of the society is actually in Baltimore, Maryland, where Norma Hooks um, lived. Um, it, it she wasn't in Baltimore, but, but you know in that area, and and our our current administrative director lives in that area. So we you kind of have the home base where your you know, where your um, your money is located. Um, as for the as for the nonprofit, I I don't have a you know, perfect answer as to how it moved from wherever it was before to, to Ohio, but it's certainly been there for decades. It's certainly been there for decades. And of course, over time, the nonprofit laws change. And so one has to um, adjust to that. And, um, and so we were kind of out of, uh, uh, you know, out of step with the current, uh, the, the, yeah, the current policies. And so we, yeah, we had to work with a, with a, some legal folks in, in Ohio to kind of right, right size the, um, you know, the official documents, which of course, 98.9% of people don't really care about, you know, in terms of all of that, uh, all of that stuff, but it's super important to maintain the right tax status and all of that, that is, uh, uh, you know, imperative for a nonprofit. Richard's also mentioned when, when he was a host and um, about the same time when I was host at Tech, when we had our first orchestra for concerts. Yeah, it's certainly the, those orchestra um, evenings, I think, are, are something that a lot of members really look forward to. Um, I know my first IDRS conference, um, I was a teenager and it was in uh, Towson, Maryland. and. I, I still remember a Von Hulk concerto that uh, John Miller and Milan Turkovich played. And I was just blown away as a young bassoon player. I, I was, you know, kind of dumbfounded and awestruck and, and all of that. And I think, you know, and then went to uh, hear a, um, uh, a, a lecture by Norman Hertzberg uh, where he intimidated everyone intimidated most people there, I would assume, about reeds and, and, and a, you know, exam about reed making and reed properties. And I, I was, you know, 18 years old and thought, oh my God, what is going on? Um, but I, you know, I just kept a really close uh, connection with the society since then, you know, as a member and, and was always just so intrigued by it all and, and um, would get my double read and, you know, like, be so proud of reading that and you know now for most people they're like National Geographic's they just kind of like on the, on the um, they're on the bookcase right like <laughs> been in a long time and, and I think a lot of people enjoy reading those digitally now but um, but anyway we're, we're you know we're proud of, of that that publication has really uh, been something I think stellar for quite a long time and now obviously it's the content of, of the publication is also shifting as I'm sure people are aware um, you know including not only the iconography of the front covers but just the con contents of it so it, you know there's been a lot of really really significant work done over the last number of years and I, I hope that our members you know over the next years will be um, uh, pleased with what direction things are going in. Richard wrote did you start lessons with Dr. Don Hardesty Master of the Triple Crow. <laughs> Don Artisty. Wow. Yeah, that's a. Um, I, I had some lessons with Don, um, and uh, and so you know, as a, he was a university teacher in my town, and so there was this great read video. It was like on a on a Betamax or a VHS. I don't remember what it was, but um, and. Uh, I, re I remember the video because um, I went to the library to check out this video and 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 Don was um, showing people how to wrap well instead of using string on the tube um, he had melted toothbrushes in acetone in this in this jar you know and and would did you guys probably have seen this before so he, you know he dipped the reed in the in this red or orange or kind of weirdly brown <laughs> concoction. Oh my God, Harry still does it. Um, and, uh, and he said, now be careful because this concoction will ruin your polyester pants. 
um, so I, you know, but yeah, so that's a blast from the past on hard to see. Um, but you know, it, it, I guess all, all together, it, it, uh, just shows, gives the, the whole flavor of our, of our, uh, <laughs> you know, not only IDRS as an organization, but double lead players uh, per se, you know, we, we are a colorful bunch and we have oddities, that is for sure. And we, we need to embrace them. <laughs> So resourceful, you know, with those the plastic toothbrushes, you got to find another use for them. So it's wonderful. I've never tried that. <laughs> my mother didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, I, I went to the <laughs> I went to the grocery store and bought you know, like yes. twenty toothbrushes. Because of course you don't need that many, but I didn't know how <laughs> how much they would, you know, dissolve in this concoction. And so you know, then put more all this acetone in a thing. Like, what is happening? But you know. That's okay. <laughs> this next question has come from Lee. It's about a course from university that you wish you had been offered or for your students now. Well, I, I probably have a lot of them. I mean, the irony is that I, I, you know, have three degrees in performance and my, none of my degrees had an actual course in bassoon pedagogy at that time. Um, that has changed, I assume, in most schools as it has in mine. But um, uh, you know, I was always interested in teaching, and and I had a lot of um, very master classes that I had to do for my teacher, Bill Winstead. You know, where he would he would put things together that essentially would be um, what one would get out of a class in studying pedagogy. So that that's super important. And I think those core for a teacher are important. Um, I think for general, just for all musicians, um, I, I really feel strongly that um, both mental, mental and physical wellness need to be addressed more than they are in the curriculum. Um, and, and so sometimes I feel like it's just a box, you know, like, oh, we sure or to, you know, the, the, the mental health, like, hotline of whatever, you know, so I, I think all of that would be, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, especially, it's, I guess both, but especially physical health, because I, I find so many students getting injured. Um, and, and we do that, though, but I think it would be helpful if it was integrated, you know, more at least maybe it is in many, many other schools, but I think in my institutions, it, it could probably be better than it is in terms of how it's integrated. Could you share with us about your bassoon? Well, yeah, I currently have one bassoon. I used to have a bassoon and a basson, but I, um, <laughs> I no longer have my uh, bouffe bassoon as I gifted it to a student who uh, would much more likely get use out of it than I was, um, which I'll talk about later. But I, yeah, I play on a 9000 series heckle uh, that I purchased in the mid 90s uh, from another bassoonist pe people uh, might know, uh, Fernando Traba, who lives in Sarasota and has played in the Sarasota Orchestra for a long time. Um, it was actually Fernando's father's bassoon. Uh, Fernando uh, his father, uh, his family is from Mexico City, and so he, his father was a professional bassoonist, and at that time, Fernando's bassoon had been stolen. It was one of those um, bassoons that came up in the IDRS as stolen, you know, uh, bassoons in, the, in the, that iteration of the double read. Um, there was always a list of, like, people who've gone lost, you know, people we didn't, the organization lost track of, and stolen instruments. I kind of remember those two. And... Um, and so Fernando had an instrument stolen, uh, a 12,000 series uh, heckle when he was, I think, in New York. And so his father had sent this 9,000 for him to use because his father was retired. And um, so I would just happen to be in the right place at the right time. And, and when he got a newer bassoon, um, he called me up and I snatched this one up, which I still have to this day. So um, the other bassoon was a, was a buffet French bassoon that... Um, that my teacher, Bill Winstead, gifted to me when the uh, the studio at CCM or the whole school actually was um, 
they were tearing down buildings and building essentially a new campus for the College Conservatory of Music. And so all the professors had to clean out their stuff, you know. And so there were things in these cabinets that they probably had had for, you know, a long time. And in in this cabinet uh, of Bill's was a was this buffet bassoon. And so he said, do you want this? And I said, sure, I'll take it. Um, and then it sat in my cellar for a long time or basement or wherever. And I played it a little bit. Um, it had some cracks that had been repaired beautifully with scotch tape. Um, and so um, <laughs> all to say, um, one of my students at the University of Kansas named Darren Supke, um, who you guys might know, um, just really um, fell in love with the French bassoon. Um, I think maybe first from from his one of his teachers in New York, Kim Laskowski, who who studied, of course, at the Paris Conservatory and and played on a, a, a you know owned a, a French instruments and and so he just really took to this. It became part of his doctoral um, research and. And he, he ended up buying a Ducasse uh, bassoon. And then, so I thought for, uh, you know, a parting gift, I would, I would gift him this, this French basson, which needed work. And maybe he's turned it into a lamp at this time. I don't know the actual quality of it. But um, I figured it had a better chance of being utilized than in, in my uh, cellar. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, I love hearing about the scotch tape, um, you know, remedy. Are there any, you know, fun quirks or things you could share with us about your heckle? Well, I, you know, besides having a really janky case, um, I mean, it's an old Geva case that's like keeps getting, you know, a little worse and worse. And so I, I do need to get a new case. This makes me nervous you know I haven't changed it since 1996 right so like <laughs> I it's time to time to get with the um, situation I um, yeah I don't think there's anything too too weird about it it's not you know held together with duct tape and paper clips or anything like that um, I I do think uh, you know all bassoon players need to be confident or gain some confidence about taking their key work apart and knowing how to oil things and figure out if a spring is not placed in the right, you know, area. Th things that you kind of forced into that, like guerrilla um, repairmanship uh, when you're a teacher and there's nobody else around, you know, um, you kind of have to figure it out one way or another. So, so that's probably another class that I think, you know, uh, you know, should be included for bassoon players. Um, it's a pretty, pretty helpful thing. Are there any books that you could share with us that you're reading right now? Well, you know, the, the, the one I would say um, that, that maybe brings my different interests together uh, is The Inner Game of Tennis, which mm -hmm. I'm reading again after many, many times. I've actually lost a few books because I'll loan them to students and then I won't get it back. Um, <laughs> but this is Tim Galloway's book. This goes way back. I mean, it's not all that thick and you you all probably know the book but um as a tennis player myself you know it the, the book speaks to me quite a lot and um and i think i still think better than the inner game of music book even though if you don't know anything about tennis i think you can still piece it together there's something about it i think that might be a little more helpful but after the pandemic and not thinking it's a good time to kind of get back into peak performance and, and getting through difficulties and things like that. Um, so probably a few people have that on their nightstand now or <laughs> might be reading through it. Eric, my favorite quote from that book is the about the rose. When we plant a rose seed in the earth, we notice that it is small, but we do not criticize it as rootless and stemless. We treat it as a seed giving it the water and nourishment required of a seed. When it first shoots up out of the earth, we don't condemn it as immature and underdeveloped, nor do we criticize the buds for not being open when they appear. We stand in wonder at the process taking place and give the plant the care it needs at each stage of its development. 
The rose is a rose from the time it is a seed to the time it dies. Within it at all times, it contains its whole potential. It seems to be constantly in the process of change, yet at each state, at each moment, it is perfectly all right as it is. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to, um, you know, as I'm working uh, through that on the tennis court, actually, trying to improve that, that idea of peak performance. And then it, it, it constantly, it puts me in the student, you know, because I, I take lessons, so it, it puts me into the, the position of being a student again. And that's all very helpful for any of us who teach, you know, to be reminded of, of the, the thought process and the difficulties and the, um, just the manner in which it's a, a bit different when it's on that side of the the ledger, you know, so, um, yeah, so we'll see. Hopefully I'll, you know, not only play some great concerts coming up, but we'll win a few matches, you know. <laughs> thank you so much, Eric, and thank you everyone for being here.